Well, welcome everybody to information session number eight. We will be talking about creating the most livable city. Um, so here with us today, we have a number of council staff. We've got our, our Deputy Chief Executive for District Development, John Paul Gaston, and also another councillor, Sandra Kai Fong, at the back. So um, as we go through, we've got a couple of awesome guest speakers, um, but please save any questions that you have till the end. So um, it's great that you come because this is an opportunity for you to ask any questions of the presentation or if you've got any more detailed questions, we'll be here at the end to catch up with you about those two. So um, let's kick it off. At last week's session, we um, looked at our infrastructure challenges and also opportunities. So we had our Deputy Chief Executive Stavros Michael and Thomas Colle from the Rotorua Lakes Council here to look at what the role of infrastructure and in supporting housing and growth actually looks like when we're addressing the challenges that we face. So we discussed how growth is funded, which is important and sometimes expensive, and we also looked at how we can fund it now as well as considering for future too. So Stavros talked to us about enabling infrastructure and ensuring that its resilience is there for the future. And Thomas talked us through how we fund that here at the Rotorua Lakes, Lakes Council um, and what considerations we take into consideration. So it was a very informative session which really highlighted some of the complexities about infrastructure, how we fund it and the work that's being done here in Rotorua as well as the work that needs to continue happening in order to address Rotorua's housing needs. So these information sessions around housing are really aimed at improving our community understanding as well as engagement. So it's been really great to see you all here. Um, and these sessions are also being videoed, so please, please, please share them with anyone that you think might be interested that can't make it today. Um, they will be up on the council website for you to view. So if I just quickly run over our housing key messages, then I'll go through our agenda and some of um, the key points around our journey. So our housing uh, messages has really been that Rotorua is unfortunately dealing with a housing crisis. So we have the evidence there that shows that our city and our district has a severe lack of homes. So council has been working with urgency to respond to the demand that we're feeling. Rotorua is growing and with that growth we will continue to change. So we need to be ready and we need to act now. We get that message pretty loud and clear and I assure you that's what we're doing. So our community of Rotorua now has that opportunity to actually plan for the future and one that enables our city to grow in a way that protects but importantly also enhances those things that we love about our home. So Rotorua is not a victim to growth, there are a lot of opportunities that will come for us now and in the future too. So this housing crisis is universal. Um, we have challenges that are unique to our home here in Rotorua though um, that we will respond to. So Rotorua is in a good position to act on the growth that we are experiencing. And we can also learn from other cities. So housing has become council's number one priority. So what is council's role? Basically it's to enable and encourage growth and build those partnerships with those who can actually deliver on what we need um, to help our community to thrive. So we can't do this alone. Everyone needs to work together to help Rotorua reach its potential to be a great place uh, to live, work, play and also to invest. So we want people who love Rotorua to be involved in these plans that we're making um, to build a city that everyone can and wants to live in. So our council also acknowledges the important role that mana whenua plays here and which is why we have been partnering with Te Arua and are committed to working together to ensure that those values and principles of Te Arua underpin all of our conversations around housing, growth, wellbeing and also the environment. So if we go to our agenda, today's session we have expert urban designers from Isthmus and Veros who will be sharing some of our journey to date, their perspectives on creating the most livable city, priority developments for Rotorua and also looking ahead to further inner city revitalisation. So first up we will have David Irwin um, from Isthmus. If I can give you just a quick uh, up, update about them. So Isthmus is an integrated design-led studio. They were originally established in 1988 and they have staff that are spread across studios in Auckland, Tauranga, Wellington and also Christchurch. So David who's here with us today is the founding director with over 30 years experience in this field of landscape arch architecture and urban design. 
and with his work has been awarded numerous times by the New Zealand Institute of Landscape Architects. Pleasure to have you here. So David's work has brought him to Rotorua um, and part of their work includes our beautiful Rotorua lakefront redevelopment. So today David will be talking to us about his journey to date, what a livable city means to him and his work and what the building blocks could look like for this and what it could mean for Rotorua. After David, we'll then also have Adele Hadfield from Veros. So Veros is a team with over 30 property industry professionals who specialise in strategy, property advisory, development, management, project management and asset management across New Zealand. They also partner with landowners, developers, organisations, co co corporations, <laughs> Iwi, Māori Trust and also local government. So I've been keeping Adele very busy lately. Um, Adele, who's with us today, is the Strategic Projects Director and she brings over 20 years experience. So she's worked really closely with our Rotorua Lakes Council Policy Planning Team, who is also here today. And Adele will talk to us about how Rotorua has evolved, what growth means, and then we'll also explore what livability looks like now and in the future and how to get there. So following David and Adele's presentations, we'll then take any questions that you may have. Um, but before I hand you over to uh, David, I just want to talk about some of the key placemaking projects which are already underway here in Rotorua. As creating the most livable city is not something we are just starting now. It's a journey that we have always been on and will continue to be on in the future. So our journey. It started with the Vision 2030 which outlines some big moves and projects um, to achieve goals. So we have a vision to action plan, which uh, Rotorua Lakes Council is working alongside our partners with. So these are some of the key projects that are being delivered currently in the central area, helping us to create the most livable city. So if I can run through them briefly, we have our lakefront redevelopment, which David will speak to, and that's steeped in the history of Te Arua. So with support from central government, we are developing a world-class community asset down there at the lakefront. The development of the lakefront will bind the lake with the land, the past with the present, and the physical with the unseen. So it will pay tribute to our collective histories and also honour the intrinsic beauty of our place and Rotorua Nui a Kapumata Moimoi, our lake. We also have Te Whare Taonga o Rotorua, our museum which is a community asset much loved by our community and the strengthening of the building and redevelopment of the visitor exhibitions and experience is a big part of that project. Um, they go to the Sir Howard Morrison Centre, which you'll see is coming along very nicely. Um, we've been strengthening and restoring that and the vision for the centre is to be a high quality, fit for purpose venue, which is a destination venue known for its high quality, relevant shows and also major events. So it's a venue with high audience and community participation, that community factor is really important there, and it's supported by strong and focused leadership, operational excellence, both within and beyond the doors. So we can't wait to open that up towards the end of the year. Another placemaking project, which is important to many people that also visit this library, is the Rotorua Aquatic Centre and the redevelopment, another key community asset. So the redevelopment that we're doing at the Rotorua Aquatic Centre um, ensures that the facility meets modern safety codes, it's fit for purpose, but also it's future-proofed for our families too. So our first stage is focused on bringing the facilities up to a standard that the community expects. Um, many of you will know that the Aquatic Centre has looked the same for a very long time, <laughs> so we're excited for that and also provide um, the best platform for long-term use of that aquatic centre. Um, we then have Quido Park Revitalisation, so an iconic family-friendly inner city park that is also a must-see geothermal destination for our visitors. There have been many developments down in Quido Park over the years, progressively adding more value for our community too. So work has been completed there to support the markets, a new basketball court and also some environmental improvement projects. So we also have longer term plans that are currently being developed and include discussion around the new skate park and also a children's water play area. So plenty happening down there. And then finally, we have our private investment project, um, Waiariki Hot Springs and Spa, which has been developed by Pukeroa Orua Fata. That's going to be a luxury spa and wellness centre situated down there on the shores of Lake Rotorua 
and it will deliver health and wellness experiences which is infused with Chiarua and Māori culture to create a rejuvenating experience that everybody remembers, shares and then hopefully attract more people here to visit us too. So um, as you can see we already have a lot going on here to make Rotorua the most livable city. Our journey has definitely already started. So now I'm going to hand you over to David to get his perspective on creating the most livable city. Um, so David has been key to our lakefront development and I'd now like to invite him up to share his presentation. Uh, <coughs> Kia ora and thanks, that was a that was, um, great little in intro. Um, I actually um, I was going to veer off a bit just before I even start. Uh, I, JP uh, asked me to do this talk with Adele a while back and I think we had a bit of COVID and a few things so I've been thinking about it for a while and uh, actually wrote out my notes quite a bit, bit of time ago but I didn't really know how to um, illustrate it because I, what I didn't want to do was uh, tell you guys and show you a whole lot of stuff that you already know, it's your town not mine and so <coughs> I came down last week and um, spent the afternoon, late afternoon, because I normally shoot photos in the afternoon, late in the evening or early in the morning, and uh, of course it was raining. So uh, that was interesting. So you're going to see an interesting group of slides to start with, so bear with. They'll be a little bit different, trying to, trying to I suppose, illustrate something that's different about the place rather than what you normally see day to day. The other thing I think that's important just for the note is that it is uh, Matariki and this is a good time for doing a little talk like this. I've got 20 minutes today of me indulging in the topic and I think this time for a reflection to look forward it is, it is what this talk's sort of about because there is some really important decisions that need to be made going forward. So here we go. The first thing is that I I grew up with my feet in the mud of the Monga Monga Roa. Now that's a stream that runs into the Waitamata in the east of Auckland. So I live in a Tamaki Makaurau. I don't come from Rotorua, I visit here a lot, but I'm from Auckland. I live there with my wife and we have an adult son. And I work around the country, as has been said, we, I get to travel. So I'm working on projects at the moment from Auckland down to Invercargill, literally. And more than 30 years ago, I um, was a founder of a design studio called Dismas Group, which it still is today. And we have these three studios across the world too. Uh, 90 people, about up to 100. Um, and we're doing working in landscape architecture, um, architecture, urban design, and graphic design. So we're, we're inter integrated as some interesting conglomeration. I consider myself a designer. Um, because I cross across all those sorts of things. But in fact, I'm a landscape architect who specialises in urban design. As a result of that, I consider myself as a, uh, a city builder. And in my past, we've designed and I've got built important parts of our cities, the streets, the subdivisions, housing, parks and reserves, and waterfronts. These are key parts of the city. And... Um, I've even been lucky enough to design and get built an entirely new suburb, nearly 5,000 people, and um, that project created a benchmark for higher density suburban living. So it's sort of one of the benchmark projects in the country at the moment. So urban design itself, this is my professional background with landscape architecture sitting underneath it, it's an interesting profession. It is um, perhaps one of our, in our world, one of the design professions which are currently the flavour of the month because not only Rotorua, but everybody else has got these similar sort of issues. So we're having to be, be, um, be cognitive of all these different things that are going on. So it's like we're in, we're in sort of quite high demand. And what's interesting about it is that we can come to it from different backgrounds. So there's architecture, get into it via architecture, which has perhaps sort of got a form base to it that's seen as really important. There's the planning which is sort of around policies and controls and what those outcomes are. It's sort of about controlling outcomes. And there's landscape architecture, which is my one, which is coming from a contextual um, part of, uh, and a landscape is part of the critical foundation for how we sort of view the world. And for me, that's my, my, my lens is coming from that landscape architecture one. You'll hear from Adele after me, 
and she's coming at it from a different angle, from a more of a planning angle, but not entirely, and she can talk to her own background. Um, and what's important about this is that these are all appropriate, these are all interesting, they've all got to work together, they've all got to work in unison to come up with something better. And what, if we can bring those things all together, you get something better than the, than the sum of the parts. <clears throat> Obviously, I've been doing this all for some time now, and I've been lucky enough to work on these different projects, on these different cities, for instance, and I'll give you some examples. Wellington's Oriental Bay, you might know that. The CBD in Wellington's waterfront, that, that interface. Auckland's downtown waterfront, which has just got finished. Uh, Onehunga's waterfront, with the new motorway extensions through there. Beachlands Coastal Walkway, New Plymouth's Coastal Walkway, and Hobsable Point. And it'll be fair enough to say that I'm currently feeling that I'm on some sort of um, personal, professional renaissance. Um, a period where I'm sort of look, trying to look back at, and believe more and more in my roots in landscape architecture and using urban design as the method, but actually believing in my, um, in my original roots. And the reason for that will become obvious. Um, and this is a good thing for someone of my age, because I could be out at pasture by now, but I'm actually uh, highly motivated, which is a good thing. I basically believe in the sort of fundamental importance of place. So your word that's already been used, um, and that, there, that we need to understand what this is. That this, there's an understanding that place is some form of combination of the physical, the contextual, the community, and the spiritual. And we need to, this feeling, the sense that we need a sense of belonging out of all of this stuff, and that this is all fundamental to our well-being, and that there's a sense of worth that comes with this, and that without this sense or this well-being, we are without a home, and without that, without that connection, we become lost, and with that, our pride, and with that, our well-being will be lost, adding to the sort of hopelessness that we get this feeling from in certain parts of our society. So that we need to be able to bring all these things together to actually avoid it, and that's this idea of a sense of place. The reason for this inspiration that I've got around these things is that I believe in this understanding of landscape is critical to city building in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And as a studio, our studio, Isthmus, we're, we're inspired by, we call it this idea of land, people and culture. And we want to make that, make that uh, New Zealand this better place. To do this, we say that we're inspired to build a new Aotearoa. Make it more than a name change, a place that is inspired from and represents the, the land, the people, and the culture of Aotearoa. And this is really important. And it's something that I think that as a, as a, as a, as a nation, as a council, and it's a studio, and as individuals, we're all working towards this. We're all slowly trying to work out what this all means. So it's, we're all on some sort of journey to this, to this new thing called Aotearoa. And it's quite interesting, because recently I've been working on this large, tricky project down in um, downtown Auckland. It's called Te Wananga. It's the new um, area down beside the ferry building there. And if you've been to Auckland recently, you'll see that that's got a new big deck with a whole, whole lot of holes cut in it. And that's some of our work. And it's an interesting project because it's a new public space that is, a, is t um, taken over from what was QE2 Square, which got sold. And it's the rebuilding of the space down there. And what was interesting about it is that our, our client there gave us a challenge. And the challenge was set to us like this. He said, guys, we want to go from Auckland to Tamaki Makaurau. I'm sort of, what does that mean? So we shorten it down to, we now call it Auckland to Tamaki. Take Auckland, and we want to know what Tamaki looks like. The idea being that whatever we did, how we did it, and what it looked like, need to re needed to represent something that was new into the future. So that was really interesting. And if we're going to call that and get it right, we'd call this now Tamaki Makaro and we'd no longer be called Auckland. This is a really um, cool concept for me. I was sort of mind blowing. And we all worked for a number of years to work out what that meant. And we'll, you guys can go over there and have a look and see whether you think we got something. 
Um, but it applies to lots of things. So the question is, what does this actually mean for <coughs> Rotorua? And my point here is a lot, actually. Because if we're going to build a livable city, and to hold livable city up as an objective, and maybe even a vision, because that's what the city's sort of using it for, then we need to understand what that means. I mean, we need to understand what that means specifically for Rotorua. Over the years, I've seen many versions of these sort of good city descriptions. There were smart cities, they were a thing, and they were a big thing in, uh, in Tauranga. We've had sustainable cities, we've had green cities, and now we've got livable cities. And as such, I do get a little cynical as to the true benefit and of um, getting excited around the term per se, except for the fact that it helps us talk about what is best for cities. It helps us focus the conversation on what is best for our city. And that, I think, is super useful. What I think the most important part of this definition is that it puts people in the middle of the definition, not the transport mode or the three waters or any other piece of infrastructure. And that works well for me because people are also in the middle of my inspiration, which we talked about was land, people, culture. The infrastructure to me is in the service of those three things and that's absolutely <coughs> fundamentally critical but just don't tell all the engineers because they have the keys for all the money. So let's deal with this livable city definition. So I looked it up on Google, as you do, and the first, first um, sort of definition that comes up was one that says, comes from a... Um, a group called Livable Cities, and they're based in San Francisco, which is where this thing came from. And it says, Livable Cities provide equitable access to the necessities of life, including housing, mobility, food, services, education, and meaningful work. It gives all residents an opportunity to participate in the civic, economic, and cultural life of the city. It's an interesting statement. <coughs> Who could disagree? It seems to be less, less to do with city building infrastructure and more to do with social and economic accessibility and the equity of its provision. And that being said, the planners and the policy makers and the politicians in the room are all get excited because that is what they're strong in. And as designers like me who build stuff, perhaps less so. But I disagree. This livable decision, a uh, livable city in its descriptions is in fact placeless. It is anonymous. It could be anywhere. But we are not anywhere. We are in Rotorua and this is your home. The whenua and the land is critical to everything um, we do in New Zealand. It's an unusual thing about New Zealand. And without acknowledging it, without the whenua, the environment, the lake being healthy, the people will not be healthy and our society not be healthy as a result. And therefore, for a city to be livable in Aotearoa, the whenua, the land, the people, we need to acknowledge those things. There needs to be something needs to be done to help improve them. There needs to be a sense of belonging and understanding of the city for it to move forward. And therefore, the livable city, <coughs> by definition, is a lofty goal but it's not just, it needs to be placed in Rotorua itself. It's, we're not here in San Francisco where that was written. And while San Francisco may have the Golden Gate Bridge, streetcars, um, some really steep hills which are great for car chases, some amazing heritage housing and seafood, it is, in an urban design terms, being described in a recent book as the hollowed out city where once the city proud of its gay pride and its culture and the alternative art scene, it has been ho hollowed out and those indicators of city culture have been lost as they give way to high priced housing, high priced housing, rents, all as a result of the successful IT industry that sits around the city. So these arts and culture has been replaced with sort of soy lattes and Teslas. So there's some sort of balance that needs to be created here. So what of Rotorua and where is it going? What are the building blocks for our specific place based livable city? And I'm not in a position to discuss the accessibility and the, and the uh, equity of the services 
or the economic well-being of all the individuals in the city itself. Others can talk to that. But I can talk about the building blocks that I think are critical. So the critical foundations of the city. And I believe, and as I've said before, that these are land, people and culture. And in my view, Rotorua is leading the way in a number of these aspects and, the projects that, and there are projects that prove it. I feel so often that we forget how spectacular this place actually is when we live in it day to day. We should never forget. There are things that make this city as a place even more unique in the world, and that's not just the boiling mud and the steam, but the people and the real life culture that intertwines everything that's here. This is live, and it's real, and it is unique, and it is a strength to Rotorua. The other day, I was, um, well actually most days, I was following my YouTube, YouTube feeds, as you do, and on that I watch um, boats sailing around the world in exotic locations. Um, mainly just normal people travelling the world in small yachts, if you can call that normal. Um, interesting places and voyages, not the flashy and expensive, these are sort of like adventure type things. And my favourite of, of these is for, to venture to these high northern latitude places. Um, the northern side of Norway, Iceland and Greenland. The Northwest Passage and the Arctic. These, think, these places are exotic in my imagination. And, but the other day, I met a person from Norway. And they'd come all the way from northern Europe, the high northern latitudes, to visit New Zealand. Destination? Rotorua. <laughs> really? Why? The mist and the steam and the culture? Why not go to Iceland, I say? They've got all that stuff. And it's really cool. And they come back and just go, no, nah, New Zealand's far more interesting, was the reply. My point is that we forget so easily that, we, that the country that we live in is unique. Pe people travel the world to come here and be part of this place. Not just its landscape, but the way it lives, its culture. The way as a nation that we are trying with positive, which is positive and at times less so, results to hold up to Tiri uh, uh, Awaitangi, hold it higher than ever before, try and work in partnership together to create and build a new Aotearoa. What's more, here in Rotorua, where the steam comes from the Whenua and across the lake, we're doing this, and we have been doing this for years. In fact, the treaty was signed in 1840, and not long after, Iwi and the Crown signed another deal here in 1870, and that was called the Fenton Agreement. And that agreement created uh, and shaped the city and is what we are working with today. That's not only Fenton Street, but the, that connects the lake with Wakawera, but the hospital land was gifted and the lakefront. And that relationship of the city and the lake was created by that deed of gift. And it forms the basis of this of our layout today. A place where we as designers and local iwi artists are attempting to strengthen that relationship between the city and the lake. Attempting to showcase to all, both locals and visitors, the special place that actually Rotorua is. We are remaking that lakefront edge, not the land itself. In fact, we're making more water and less land. And hopefully we're giving back to the lake, adding more um, adding, adding more, more places for rest and respite, adding more habitat for those that live actually in the lake. And for those that want to take a little bit of time, take in Makoya to feel the special ambience that permeates Rotorua. As Minahuri, as a visitor here in Rotorua, I can feel that this place is special, that there is a presence, a spirit that seems to hover around the city. And as a keen mountain biker, I've done many sojourns into, into the city, down here to Zippy's for coffee, and spent many hours sweating my way through the forests and around the lake, so I can feel this place. But as a visitor, I don't live here, and I can't talk for mana whenua, who have always been here. And of course, many others have, like me, rested in those therapeutic hot waters and soaking in those special healing powers and the culture, which is super real. It is this reality that makes Rotorua special. Ohini Mutu is not dressed for the tourist. It is dressed for those that live here. 
and Whakapapa here. Whakawera Wera is real, it is people's homes. This authenticity shines through all that is done, and it needs to speak even louder through our city planning, through our architecture, and through our city infrastructure, and through our homes. Today and going forward, we need to stand tall and proud of this place, what it stands for, and anything less will not do. If land, people and culture, the improvement of the whenua and the environment both living and built are the foundation stones for an Aotearoa-based livable city, then the methodology to get there is partnership. And then working in partnership gives the Treaty of Waitangi its real power. And I would hold up Rotorua really high on the score. I'm working at the other end of the country at the moment, and I would suggest that the relationship that mana whenua has with council there, while improving, for sure, is light years from Rotorua. Rotorua does this better than any other place in New Zealand I know, and it seems to do it naturally, building on those long-term relationships. Although not without its drama, of course, and but if you put a whole extended family together, as you would at Christmas time, you can ex always expect something to happen. So it's not to be unexpected. But we can't just ensure the success of the city by what we build in its public spaces. No cool public space and waterfront alone will be the measure of success of well, what makes a city more livable. We need housing for our people. A livable city needs houses as well as public spaces and, <coughs> and places. These, these houses are in short supply, as was mentioned earlier. They are expensive and we need social housing and we need affordable housing and we need these houses to be placed where we can build strong communities with access to the city and its amenities. Therefore, in my opinion, these need to be places close to the city. Most probably, but not entirely, in existing suburbs close to the city centre where existing infrastructure can be leveraged. Interesting, I believe, interestingly, I believe that in doing this we'll be adding more people to existing suburbs actually improves these places, not reduces them. Done well, there is more community, more social interaction, more high up, more houses um, to the same overall infrastructure areas, such as parks and reserves and roads and cycleways, which means that they're cheaper per house to build and maintain. So I'd argue done well in places where there is the right existing infrastructure, and that is the catch, Adding density to many suburban environments improves those suburban em um, environments within that city. Now, I've spent a lot of time over my career in the last 15 years designing these sorts of spaces. So I've been working with um, what was HLC, the precursor to Kainga Ora. We've been master planning housing, massive housing projects such as Hobsable Point in Auckland. And after that, we're working on the Auckland Housing Programme for Kainga Ora. That's working in Northcote, Roskill, Wesley, and Mangari. We had 30,000 homes on our wall uh, in varying projects that we were master planning. And there's some important lessons in here. And some of them are really key, and they're quite simple. And the bottom line of all this is that it's just part of Maslow's Pyramid of Needs, if you remember what that is. And the bottom of that, of that pyramid is the concept of, it's obviously shelter. It's quite simple. Those things, those, those shelters need to be warm, dry and healthy. And alongside that needs to be this, need, it all needs to be safe. And after that, there needs to be a sense of belonging and community. One needs to be, feel safe in one's home. And one needs the neighbourhood. Look around and feel welcome and be part of something. These are actually basic human rights, shelter and safety and a sense of belonging. They are non-negotiable. They are the cornerstones of a livable city. Without, we cannot build a successful city without these things. They are prerequisites for any housing development and therefore they are a baseline for a good city. They are the nests for us humans to live in. A livable city takes us Step a step further and it says that it needs to have their equitable distribution. 
And that part seems a lot harder to deliver on, and it's beyond my remit. I can get them those places um, designed and built. We can create these places to be safer than they were before, safer streets and neighbourhood neighbourhoods. Buildings can be better for the environment and belong to the places that they that they belong to. But the next step, their allocation lives with the policy makers and the politicians, and that seems tricky. It therefore needs to all to be brought together for me to be a livable city. It's the baseline, it's not the end game. We need to design and build for a future Aotearoa, not of the New Zealand today. That would be something that we all should be aiming for. The good news is that Rotorua is a long way towards this. It's further forward than many places I work in including immediate neighbours such as Tauranga and Hamilton. You should feel proud of this, but there's a long way to go, particularly on that housing front. Temporary housing should not exist. It does not build, but destroys communities. If we build our, build our city on the whenua and we seek to improve that environment, that interfaces, whether it be the land, the lake or the air, and we build with and for the people, while respecting, respecting the culture of mana whenua and mana huri. And we do this by working together in partnership. We can build something very special. It will be an Aotearoa-based livable city. And we will need to deal with all those issues of equity and the housing and the distribution of wealth. But as designers, we can add to that conversation. We can help this, thing, this place, these things happen for everybody. But there's still a lot of work yet to be done, and it's all going to need your help as well. So, thank you everybody for listening, and kia kaha. Kia ora koutou. I think the first thing I'll do is actually come out from behind there, otherwise I'm, I'm hiding. Um, my name is Adele Hadfield. I actually live in Tauranga, so just up the road. Um, my speech is going to really work off the back of David's, and uh, hopefully uh, it'll be as interesting although it's a tough gig to follow a professional photographer on a day like this. So I guess um, one of my things is one of the things that really frame us uh, at an individual level and as a community level and a city, nation and a, and a planet level is the sort of where we've come from. Now believe it or not, I come from a family of giants. All my brothers, four of them, huge rowers, builders. I can't row and I can't build. I hit my thumb more than the nail. So I've become a planner, which is a great alternative. But if you look now locally at um, Rotorua's, I guess, past and, and what's called Rotorua, there was an eruption about 250,000 years ago. And it's left us with a real legacy about what Rotorua is today. And we all live within that consequence. And one of the things that Council's dealing with, and has certainly come up through um, some things that Tanya said earlier, and probably some of the other speakers have said through this series, is the cons one of the consequences is dealing with the infrastructure requirements of living in a caldera. That's a really practical day-to-day -day thing, but we also live with the consequence through the geothermal fields and everything that makes Rotorua so unique in New Zealand and in the world. But 250,000 years ago, none of us were here, but we all live day-to-day -day with the consequence of that event. And then again, as uh, David alluded to in his um, speech, We've lived with the consequence of arrivals, first Te Arawa, and then the settlement of um, the English settlement through here. The Fenton Agreement, which has shaped the city, in particular the city centre, which I'll focus on mostly today, which runs from the lake down through to the forest, from the state highway through to the lake edge. And I guess the Fenton Re Agreement has really framed that with the gifting of those reserves through that area and the land in general to the city um, across this last what would it be, 140 years of settlement. And then that settlement is really what we're looking at today. And we look at what's happened over the last 75 or 100 years and what's yet to come and what has shaped the city. So I'm going to go back in time a little bit. This is an aerial, obviously, of Rotorua City area in 1945. Now, without wanting to offend anyone, was anyone here in 1945? No? Okay, we'll move on quite quickly. But you can see in here, basically the framework or the structure of Rotorua was set way back then. So we're still working within the guidelines that were set 
now, some 75 years ago, which really set us up for what you had, which are those strong north-south roads leading from the lake to the forest, the east-west connections leading from Quero Park through to Government Gardens, was all there, right from the very, I guess not from the very, very beginning, but from our beginning as a city. And then you fast forward to 1959, people might see as I go through these slides that there are some, again, some real landmarks that have sat on this landscape for a long, long time. Was anyone in Rotorua in 1959? Yes. What year was that? 1959. Oh, I was here in 55. Fantastic. Out of Road, the Woodsman School. Yep, so I think one of the other things, and again, David alluded to it during his time, that people shape the city as well. So if you've lived here for 60, 70 years, you've been part of the shaping of the city. And that's what's happened through here. Developers 75 years ago said, I want to do a project in there and I'll, I'll start to make the framework of the city that we'll live in 75 years in the future. And I think it's really important as planners and as uh, designers and architects and everybody to think what is our legacy as we plan now for another period of time for the future. So we jump to 1960 and we drill in a little bit here, we start to get some um, subdivisions, things are filling out, the city is filling out between the lake and the, the forest where you used to have space, now it's really urbanised all the way through there and really setting up what, we've, what we're seeing through and what we're driving through today. So 1983, um, which is now about 40 years ago, and between 1983, really actually between 1996 and about 2013, the population of Rotorua only gained 800 people. So I guess what we're seeing is that over the last sort of 30 years, really, we've all lived through a period of relatively little change. I mean, things have happened, uh, of course. We've had things like the hotel investments that have happened. Um, I think around uh, early 2000, you had the Central City Mall um, developed. So things have happened in that time. And, and again, as Tanya said, these projects happening now and some of them have legacy in the past. But again, you can just start to see, if you look really carefully through here, just some start of infill. So homes being subdivided, um, backfilled onto a back section. So that's sort of intensification, early intensification concept happening across the city now. But if you look at this, this is today. So if we go back to 1983, and then forward to today, if you actually looked deep into that space, basically because there has been that very little growth across that period, 1996 to 2013, we haven't lived through a huge period of change in, in the way we live in Rotorua. Things have felt quite stable, I think. Quite, you know, things have changed in, in terms of the way we move around, the technology's changed, all those sorts of things. But the framework, the skeleton of our city, hasn't changed a lot during that period. And, and some of you during question time might want to challenge that, and that would be a really interesting conversation. But I guess uh, where we are today, and, and that little reflection of, of moving through the past, is saying, what is, what is the next sort of 60 years of aerial photos of Rotorua going to look like? And I guess that's the challenge that Rotorua Lakes Council and the community are facing now. And as Tanya has said, there's a housing crisis, and we need to respond to that. So, so as we take those bones of our city and we look forward to the future, how do we do that? And how do we do that in a way that creates this livable community or this livable city? Well, one way is that you invest whoops, in the big things. The big things being some of the big places, which is your lakefront, which has gone through an amazing transformation, a beautiful transformation over the last couple of years. You invest in people through uh, education and employment and all those sorts of things. And you, you link all of that together. And as David said, there's, lot, there's layers and layers of thinking that go into creating a livable city. But as David was talking earlier, I was thinking about if you had to choose, because I'm a planner, and, and apologies for that, because I'm a planner, I think, what is the one measure of livability? If we could only pick one thing to say Rotorua is the most livable city in the world, how would council know that they're achieving that? And I've come up with a metric 
to do that. But I guess, in the first place, the things that Council are considering now are, are growth. Growth is happening off the back of that 800 people over that period 1996 to 2013. Suddenly, Rotorua is taking off again. And it's left again with consequences, consequences of housing shortage, consequences of a bit of pain from all the change that is occurring and the change that you're seeing and having to live with. And Council's trying to address that. And one of the things, and I won't dwell on this because David again, um, it's a good combination, has talked about the need for partnership. And the partnership starting at all levels. Partnership with mana whenua, partnership with government, and partnership with communities. And how we can actually work on this. So my concept for livability, just before we move into the um, actual uh, city centre uh, development area, is I think everyone should have a button beside their bed in the morning. And it's a green button and a red button. And if you wake up and you say, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else but Rotorua, you hit the green button. And if you wake up and you say, oh, God, I wish I was anywhere else but Rotorua, you hit the red button. And as long as we're scoring better than probably I don't know, I'm not really good at math, but 75% on the green button, I think you've just created the most livable city in the world. Because we measure it by distance to parks, and we measure it by public transport options or accessibility options, employment levels, and those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, for me, I think one of the things about livability is about choice, and it's a very personal thing, choice, about why you live here, and everyone might have a different take on why they live here. But as long as everyone's waking up in the morning and pressing the button, I think we're getting it right collectively. You can take that, JP. So this is the area really that's in focus for that city centre priority development area. And having just shared with you my button idea, I'm going to go back to my true planning roots. So it's a day to go back to your roots and talk a little bit about why that area has been selected. So one of the reasons why the area has been selected because of all this dark blue on this plan. And basically what the dark blue is saying is all those things I've just said before. This area has good accessibility, good options for walking and cycling, it's good accessibility to schools, to shops, to employment, to parks, all those things that in our day to day we need and we want to go to and visit without having too much drama in that journey. So Council's done this exercise of identifying that the City Centre already has these great bones for creating this sense of livable place. And so those blue areas really said, we should focus there. And that's a good place to put more housing and more people because we already have invested as a city over time in creating this wonderful sense of place through our investment in open space, schools and accessibility. But we can't rest there because as we put more people in, we need to make sure that those more people have the same level of access to parks, to open space, to transport, and that we have min minimised any pain of growth in the, that area. So then just um, whipping back, and this has also been talked about today, is this combination of um, Rotorua 2030, which was an exercise about saying what you wanted to see as your city by 2030. So what are the goals for, for Rotorua in 2030? And sitting along beside that are the Te Arua 2050 goals. And what the project team is working on, the um, Rotorua for Tomorrow project is doing, is trying to integrate those two sets of goals, not create another set, but working really hard to make sure everything that they invest in lines up with these goals. And from that, these five principles have been created. So you take the goals and drop down into the principles and you look at the sort of stuff that David was talking about, having that distinct global identity. And I think pretty much for me, having uh, grown up just up the road and come into Rotorua from being a child all the way through to now, it's the one city in the world, even when I lived overseas, I think that really you could blindfold someone 100 kilometres away and they'd tell you exactly the moment that you hit Rotorua because there's just no denying that sort of sense of place through, through the smell, through the sounds, through everything that is Rotorua, you know that you've hit Rotorua when you arrive here. And I think you look out the window now, and, and nowhere else in New Zealand do you have this sort of, art, sort of architecture in, in your area. So you've got a lot of distinctive, unique places already in your city. And then there's that sense of the, the sort of like the, the great big little city. So don't limit our thinking about what we can achieve, 
just because we're perceived as a small city, but really step up into that space of, of dreaming big and, and working in partnership to invest and to create fantastic places that are the envy, that pe bring people from Norway to Rotorua to see what's happening here. And those places that when you go to Norway, you go, I come from Rotorua, and everyone goes, I've always wanted to go to Rotorua. Because that's part of waking up and pressing the green button. And that's celebrating diversity. So as you change, you'll see diversity start to increase. So it's really taking that on board and celebrating that. And then just the, the last two about it, building on existing values and maintaining that strong sense of place and community. So making sure in the middle of all that, as David has said, we don't leave people behind. We're not just about place and landscape, we're actually about people and place and landscape. So we've touched on that. So then you drill down into the city uh, centre priority area, which is this area here that's been identified as one of the opportunities to really respond to that housing shortage and put some effort into creating more homes for more people in this area. And we've talked a little bit about why that area has been selected in terms of the great bones and the great structure that already exists across that space. But then you dive down again, and I think, I don't know if anyone has seen the, um, the articles in the newspaper recently about council's uh, projects or plans for the city centre for that sort of north-west link through to Tanakai Street and then the east-west links between the gardens and Kuro Park, and sort of investing in creating those really tight city centre that people can feel that they can come to and walk around. And things like Tanya's talking about in terms of the, the investment in the Howard Morrison Centre, the Aquatic Centre, Kuro Park itself, the lakefront, and you ask, why do you do that? And it's about, in a city, and especially as a city grows, there are places that people need and this is probably my experience over, over close to 30 years working in this field across uh, both New Zealand, Australia and England, is that people still need places that they can collectively gather. And often those places are city centre. So places like your lakefront, places like your performing arts centre, places like this, places like a central library, where people who otherwise wouldn't come together, come together. And that's, that's one of the key roles, I think, of a city centre, sitting outside that sort of economic powerhouse of the city and everything else. It's actually about that collective understanding of we are part of something. And I know here we might have people who live outside the city centre, but you still, if you live in the, the district, wider district, you'll come, still come to the city centre for some of the fundamental things that you want to do. The events, the activities, all of those things. So starting right up in the north there in the city centre, that focus in the pink area there, which is a sort of city centre CBD zone, it's really about making sure that that's the place where people are proud of their city. Where things like you can walk down the street and you know it's Rotorua. It's there in the design, it's there in the art, it's there in the architecture, it's there in the stories that you read as you walk around the streets. And it's there in the fact that there is uh, opportunity and employment for people all the way through there. And then you work, walk uh, down further south and you get into that sort of uh, darker yellow area. And that's the area that um, council and uh, some stakeholders have been involved in establishing this first draft of this plan have really given some thought to. That's where we could probably have more people living in sort of um, more higher density housing forms because it's close to the city centre, because it's close to schools, because it's close to the parks. So you can see a sort of graduation from the CBD through that higher density area and then into the, the further area south. But connecting through all of that, and you might just be able to see it here, are these green lines. And that's basically saying as the city gets busier and our suburbs get busier, we must make sure that people are safe as they move around. Now, I've just been involved in another project in a, in a small sort of district down in Central Hawke's Bay and they just did a, a survey of about 400 children about what children need to be able to play better. And those children all said, I just need to be able to skate or bike to my mate's place. Because basically, mum or dad won't let me leave my door and just go to my mate's place anymore. And the green lines on here are about basically seeing a child out a, a front door in a letterbox and saying, you're fine to get around the corner. You're fine to actually be like we were when we grew up where we just could walk to friends' places and mum and dad didn't have to worry about what we were doing or what the streets were like or how busy they were. 
So as change happens, there's some fundamentals that we still need to attain and get right so that we can still press that livability button in the morning, whether you're five or eight or whatever age I am, whatever age you are. And so collectively, all of that together, thinking about how these spaces still connect across there, what sort of schools we're going to need, where those schools are, how large those schools need to be, what we need to be doing to um, protect and enhance our parks and our reserves, all of those things, where we, need to do, where we need to have change to make sure that we're actually supporting things almost staying the same. So sometimes we need to change to protect things we want to protect. And I guess that's the conversation now that Council's having with the community, is about how can we change and protect the things that we really value through that change, because as a consequence of growth, we're going to get change. I think that's me wrapped up. Thank you.